The text for today's meditation comes to us from Paul's first letter to his young understudy Timothy. Chapter 1, reading at verse 18, and reads as follows. Paul says to Timothy, and to you and me today, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith, and they have made a shipwreck of their faith. Thus far the text. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen and ascended Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Christian friends, you know I thought when I was working on this sermon, usually I've got a lot of time to think about my sermon, you know, out cutting the grass, got some time out there, you know, some free time, some, some me time, some thinking time. and. You could say that's one reason I'm so long in the pulpit, right? But this past week I was busy, busy, busy. And so the congregation can rejoice in what? That this might just possibly be a short sermon. Amen? Yeah, we could quit right now, couldn't we? Amen. You know, go in peace. Serve the Lord. No! If you, like me, grew up on the farm, perhaps you have heard the well-worn, well-known statement before you tear down a fence find out why it was built in the first place if you've wandered the farmlands of our country going from hill to dale through the woods and across fields you'll see fences that have been there for 50 60 70 80 years maybe even longer fences made out of barbed wire fences made out of boards fences made out of stone and they were put there for a reason one might be a line of demarcation. This I own, that I do not. This is my property, that is my neighbor's property. And I can't go over there and do whatever I want because it doesn't belong to me. But this piece of ground, this farm, this land, it's mine. So if I decide to plant corn, I can plant corn. Sunflowers, I can plant sunflower. If I want to be a citrus grower, I will plant it from border to border in citrus trees. That fence might have been put there to keep certain things out of your field. Did you know, a little known fact here in the great state of Florida, Florida was the last state in the Union. Florida was the last state in the United States to do away with the open range. Did you know that? Up until 1950, if you were a rancher and you had cows running around out on your pastures, you did not, by law, have to fence them in. There was a major problem with that because cows don't know your property line, do they? And so they might be wandering around and go from one farm to the next, one ranch to the next. They might even go out into the highway. As a matter of fact, if you check the statistics in 19. 49, 235 people were killed in highway accidents here in Florida because a car ran into a cow. And cows, when hit by cars, have a tendency not to bounce, do they? No, they cause cataclysmic damage. That's deaths caused by cows, not to mention damage. And what people used to do if you had a farm, if you had a citrus grove, if you were an orange grower like my dad, you put a fence around your property not so much to keep things in but to keep things out. It wasn't until 1950 that the great state of Florida said if you've got cows on your property you sure better fence them in. Fences aren't limited to farms, are they? Maybe you've got one around your yard. Maybe you've got one in your backyard. You might have that fence for privacy, that big six foot tall wooden fence or maybe one made out of PVC. You want to go out there in your bathing suit and get a suntan and you don't want your neighbors seeing you and so you put a fence around that, right? Or maybe you got a dog in your yard. You want to let him out and let him run, let him play and you don't want him running away, do you? So you build a fence to keep him in. Before you tear down that fence, find out 
why it was built in the first place. A lot of people, especially in the unbelieving world, the secular world, the non-believing world, those who have turned their backs on God and on Jesus Christ and on his word, they look at the word of God, the Bible, and they say that's a fence that limits us, that holds us in, that stops us from enjoying life time and time and time again. I have heard people talk to me about Christian religion as though it is a religion of don'ts. Don't do this and don't do that. It, it keeps us from enjoying life, they say. We want to go out and experience. We want to explore. We want to try new things. After all, isn't that part of our human nature and I say yes it is it's the reason Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate of the forbidden fruit human nature because of sin constantly wants to drift away from God wants to wander away it's the reason God himself compares us to sheep I don't know if you've ever had any experience with sheep or not, but they're not too smart. They're not too loyal. They're not too faithful. It's the job of the shepherd to do their thinking for them. If a sheep looks at a hole in the fence, he doesn't look at that and say, you know what, I ought not to go through that hole because I might go out into the world and, and get devoured by a wolf or a fox or a lion out there in the world. I might fall over a, a cliff to my death. I might get caught in a crack or a crevice. I might wander into a, a bramble bush and my long woolly coat will get snagged and I will be trapped. The sheep doesn't think about that, does he? He looks at that hole in the fence and he thinks, aha, greener grass is in another pasture. Likewise, you and me. Likewise, all people in the world, no matter how good we have it, it's our human nature to, to think, to dream, to imagine that, you know what, if we could get outside of our boundaries, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Friends and fellow Christians, I'm here to tell you today, the grass is green where it is well watered. The grass is green where the ground has been carefully cultivated and nurtured and enriched. It's the reason God builds a fence around each and every one of us. I tell you what I want you to do this week. As part of your devotion, as part of your meditation time with God, I want you to go home sometime this week. Today would be great because it'll be fresh in your mind. Today, this afternoon, this evening, when you're having that prayer time with God, that conversation and communion time, jump into the Old Testament, find the book of Hosea, the book of Hosea, and read chapter 2. Concentrate on chapter 2 in the Old Testament book of Hosea. God looks at his people, his Old Testament people, who have wandered away following the promises of of false gods and God tries to woo them back come back to me come back to me come back to me I'm not going to tell you what it says because I want you to go home and read it go home and read what God says about the people of Israel and you and me today in Hosea chapter 2 I'll tell you this much it has to do with fences. When Paul writes his letter to his young understudy Timothy. He talks about fences as well. Fences and foundations. Here's this brand new pastor, this very young pastor, has studied the Bible, has, has delved into the depths of all those biblical truths, and now he's a pastor of the church in Ephesus. And turmoil is going on in that church. There's a group of people within that church. When you and I talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we talk about it as an accomplished fact. The 
first Easter Sunday, the women go to the tomb to prepare the body of Jesus Christ for burial. Lo and behold, they're questioning themselves as they make their way to the tomb. Who will roll away the stone for us? How will we get inside? They go, they find the stone rolled away, an angelic figure sitting up on top of that stone who asks them the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen just as he said he would. And you and I know that Jesus Christ overcame death and the grave and by overcoming death and the grave, by shedding his righteous blood upon the cross of Calvary, he has washed our sins away. He has taken our sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west where they will be remembered no more. And we rejoice in that. That, my friends, is the theme of every Christian funeral. That's the reason when an individual passes away, when a good Christian friend or loved one dies, when they go from this life on to the next, we gather together to celebrate. Because we now celebrate that that individual is now in heaven, right now in heaven, not because of what they have done. They didn't buy eternal life. They didn't purchase a ticket to heaven. Christ Jesus purchased that ticket for them with his blood upon the cross. And the work that he did, the salvation work that he did, is proven by the empty tomb. But there were some people in the church in Ephesus in Paul's day, in Timothy's day. They said, you know what? The resurrection is an accomplished fact, but it's over. It's done. It's finished. They took the resurrection message to mean that we should be reborn and resurrected in our daily life. And they said, that's it. That's done. You try to live as good a life as you possibly can, and that's it. Timothy is struggling with this heresy in his church, wondering what he should do. And Paul writes to him a word of encouragement. Be faithful. Be faithful. Faithful to the word. Faithful to the gospel. Faithful to the message of Jesus Christ. Don't dilly-dally. Don't try and water it down to make everybody happy. Stay true and stay faithful to the word. Friends and fellow Christians, I dare say that's a message the Christian church needs to hear again and again and again today. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a little more homework. If you're on the internet, if you have the ability to get on the World Wide Web, this afternoon when you go home, sit down in front of your computer, go up to that search bar and type in the words her church her church you can also get there by typing in purple church purple church it is a lutheran church my friends out in the great state of california that worships the goddess that worships the goddess they even do dances during the worship service to the goddess god what an abomination They even, I, I'm not making this up, you'll see it if you Google it. They even have witchcraft services, services where witches come and lead the worship service and they call themselves Lutheran, as Luther would say, ach du lieber. They are not of our synod, they are not Missouri synod. I won't mention which synod they are, but there are some here in our own area. You can guess. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And they cover all of this abomination. Abomination is what it is. It is of the devil. Because as we heard today, when Paul tells us how to pray to God, he doesn't say to call God mother or mom or mama. He says what? You know what? God loves you so much. You have such a precious relationship with God in heaven that you can call him daddy. Imagine that. Calling God daddy. That's how much God loves us. But he calls himself Father for a reason. 
And we dare not change that. We dare not corrupt the Word of God. You see, here's the great trap and the great temptation. People that corrupt the Word of God, inevitably they do so what? Under the guise of love, under the covering of love. We love people. We want to reach out to them. We want to embrace them. We want to welcome them. We want them to come here and we will give them our message of love. But friends, it is not loving. It is not gracious. It is not kind to teach them something that is false. especially in regard to eternal salvation and eternal redemption, our eternal dwelling in heaven. Woe to them, Jesus says. Blind guides, he calls them. I watched that video on YouTube about her church, and they showed them dancing there in the sanctuary, and there they are gyrating around. You know, and I don't have any problem dancing in the sanctuary. I think that would be, you know, the little children, they came up, they did their song, they did their dance. I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was wonderful. But notice the message that they were proclaiming, victory in Jesus Christ. We all rejoice in that. But at this church, her church, they were teaching the little children to dance like little witches, right? And I saw that and I couldn't help but think to myself the words of Jesus Christ. If one of you leads one of these little ones astray, it would be better that you tie a millstone around your neck and be cast into the depths of the sea. Jesus has a very special heart, place in his heart for children and a very special word of judgment and condemnation for those who lead little children astray. Paul's word to Timothy and to us today, stay faithful. Stay faithful to the word of God. And stay faithful to the whole word of God. You see, here's, here's where the water, waters get muddied, all right? You and I don't deny the resurrection. We do not deny the power of Jesus Christ over death and the grave. We do not deny what happened on Calvary's hill. But I was talking with a good Christian friend not too long ago, several weeks ago, not a member of this church, so don't look around and try and figure out who it is, not a member of this church, but a Christian individual nonetheless. And he and I were talking about the Bible and the Word of God, and I asked him, do you believe in the six days of creation? And he asked me what I meant, and I said, well, according to the Bible, if you look there in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, literally it says yom, right? Yom, the Hebrew word is yom. We know it is Yom Kippur, you know, the word Yom means day, a 24-hour period of time. According to the Bible, God created the world in how many days? Six days, right? Six days. That's what the Bible says. And I believe it. Simply because the Bible says it. And you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. What about all this scientific evidence about the world being millions upon millions upon millions of years old? Maybe those six days were a figurative word. Maybe it took six million years or six billion years. You know what? If it took God that long to make the world, he would have said so. If we believe that God is all-powerful, almighty, capable of creation. Why do we have such a hard time believing that it only took him six days to make not only the world but the universe and all the life therein? Because you see, here's the danger. As St. Augustine said 1700 years ago, if I pick and choose those parts of the Bible that I want to believe and reject those parts of the Bible that I do not want to believe, what I end up believing is not the Bible, but myself. Here's the problem, and here's the danger. 
if we deny a little bitty part of the Bible, the line of thinking is that then I can deny other parts of the scriptures as well. If I can deny that God made the world in six days, why can I not deny that Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish? How then can I not deny that he walked on water? How then can I not deny that he turned water into wine? Paul says, stay faithful. Stay faithful to the whole will and word of God. Because if I throw out a little bitty piece, the danger is that I can throw out another piece, and then another piece, and then a, another piece on top of that. I have to stay faithful to the entire word of God. And you say once again, well, what about science? What about all this stuff that I see on TV? What about this stuff that I read on the internet? What about all of this stuff that they taught me in school? Friends, okay, you're trying to put science against religion. This, this is not proven by science, but we believe it. You cannot prove by science that Jesus walked on water. You cannot prove by science that Jesus turned water into wine. You cannot prove by science that Jesus took the lunch of a little boy and fed over 5,000 people with it. You cannot use science to justify faith. Faith which, as the Bible says, the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not yet seen. And so we take that word of God and we build a fence. Not to hem us in. Not to cheat us out of the joys of the world. But for our protection to keep us safe. That, my friends, is what you'll discover in Hosea chapter 2. It's the very word of encouragement that Paul gives Timothy in chapter 1. Remain faithful to the word of God so that your people are nourished, so that your people are enriched, so that your people are edified, so that their salvation rests assured in their conscience, in their soul, in their mind. So that there is no doubt whatsoever that God loves them and loves them richly. Friends, that's my word of encouragement to you today. Stay faithful in the word. Trust in the promises of God and be protected by the love, the grace, the mercy of our loving Father in heaven. Friends and fellow Christians, with that I say, Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith, which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.